course. You know, lots of apparel, shoes, hats, mm -hmm. belts, accessories, things of that nature. The men's section is nice back here. Ooh, you okay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm Eric Baker, and I've spent my life crossing the Southeast on tour as a singer-songwriter. But I recently realized I was always headed to the next town instead of seeing the sights along the way. So I teamed up with my friend Ariel Nicole to check out what we've been missing. We hope to take you to places you never knew existed or where you've always dreamed of going. If you know much about me, then you've likely picked up on the fact that I'm a fitness fanatic. Being active and earning aches is often how I define a good time. And for many years, that belief was built on a foundation of firm routines and flavorless foods. But the truth of the matter is, true health is based on balance. I recently read that exercise is a celebration of what you can do, not a punishment for what you ate. And ever since, I've tried to take the intent of these words into every task I take on. Let me tell you, it's made a difference. In just a short time, I've started seeing everything as a celebration. Work? Excuse me while I celebrate what I can create. Exercise? Allow me to celebrate what I can accomplish. Food? Don't mind if I take a bite out of the bounty this world brings. I say all this to explain, a simple quote really changed my perspective, and when I started looking at life through a new lens, I realized I could constantly be gorging on what life has to give, good or bad. All while being my best self in the process. So on this episode of Tennessee Valley Uncharted, I'm gorging on what Northeast Alabama has got to offer, and to get started, I'm headed off to open up a mixed bag as opposed to packing one. Welcome to Scottsboro and Thank welcome you. to Unclaimed Baggage Center. I mean, you are in the home of the land of lost luggage. We are all the right. only place in America that buys and resells unclaimed baggage. And I'm, let's walk and talk and see yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, I'm ready. So the business actually started almost 50 years ago okay. in a small two-bedroom house where it was Mr. Owens rented and it and sorted through the items that he bought from a bus line back in the day. Okay. And by the mid-70s, he realized he was on to something. Mm -hmm. So he moved to the property where we are now mm -hmm. and started approaching the airline industry. And by the mid-70s, we were much larger than the small two-bedroom house yeah. we started off in and had these fantastic long-term exclusive contracts with the carriers to buy their unclaimed baggage. So we are yep. 40,000 square feet of unclaimed baggage. This building is huge. So it is. I know you got all kinds of good stuff in here, It too. is. <laughs> so there's apparel and shoes, mm -hmm. eyeglasses, sunglasses, books. Mm -hmm. There's some fantastic electronics. So some of our found treasures, which are some of the really unique and interesting things that we've gotten in over the years, mm -hmm. are showcased on the upper walls around our store. Those so bikes. there's wooden snowshoes and a turtle shell. A turtle shell. We actually have one that a guest let us borrow for a number of years. It was probably three feet large. Really? Yeah, with barnacles still on it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. He had bought it back in the 70s. Wow. And he had it displayed in his pool house for a <laughs> number of years. Those had to come from, like, not your average traveler. Well, and that's the thing. You know, you sit on the plane and you look around and you go, these are pretty normal people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess you never know. <laughs> that's, true. that's true. You never know who's, who's bringing what on You're the plane. You're exactly and... right. How much would you say comes in daily? Well, we stock to our sales floor close to 7,000 unique wow. items a day. But keep in mind, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of travelers, and they are carrying probably more than one bag. That's true. And you're trying to pack as much into it as you can. Yeah, that's and true. And so when you take that very small percent, mm -hmm. and we're one store, we're not multiple stores in major markets. Yeah. You know, people have mm -hmm. to make an effort to get here, mm -hmm. and they do. Yeah. You know, we're one mm -hmm. of the top tourist destinations in the state of Alabama. That's so cool. Nearly a million visitors a year come here. We currently have a gold and diamond bracelet in our showcase that appraises for, you ready for it? Oh, gosh. $42,000. Oh, my God. How do they not try to find that bracelet? Well, oh. my guess is if you could afford a $42,000 bracelet, you could probably afford another one with your insurance payout. That's true. Yeah. Or when you said that, though, I'm buy like... a boat and buy a smaller yeah. piece of jewelry, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's my thinking. I'm like, what else can I get for this? Oh, my God. I would cry if I lost something that expensive. Back into the men's section. You know, we 
say a lot of times this is the best value in the store, in particular with the men's suits, mm. because suits are so expensive. They are. And so we have lots of blazers, lots of full suits. Ooh, that's um, a good rack to hit up. Oh, yes. Some really extra good stuff. savings. <laughs> yes, some extra good stuff out here. But this is the department that I also referred to as Wild Kingdom. We have our stuffed goose and whale vertebrae they or snake skin. skin. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you think there had to be a snake yeah, in there at some point, you know? I really thought of snakes on a plane. <laughs> oh, I haven't told you the best one yet. We have had a live rattlesnake come in before. In a suitcase? Yes. It was years ago. It never made it to the sales floor, but yes, we had a live rattlesnake. Oh, my before. gosh. I, did, I would have had a heart attack. I've often wondered what I could learn about the people around me if, say, I was a fly on the wall or could hear their inner monologue. But the thought never crossed my mind what insight I would gain if I knew what was inside their luggage. TSA, if I'd only known. It makes sense, though. These are the items that when we choose to leave the comforts of home, we feel as though we can't live without. But sadly, in this situation, that's exactly what happened. They were ultimately separated, never to see one another again. Still, a place like this puts a little meaning to that predicament lending new life to what was otherwise never to be found. And given that I'm all about bargains, this is a place where I can drink in the deals and gorge on the goods again and again. As I mentioned before, I think there's a beauty to balance, which is why I try to embrace the things that excite me as much as the things that intimidate me. Tumbling Rock Cave may have gotten its name from the geographic features we're about to gaze, but glancing into the first couple caverns, I can't deny that it was aptly named. The terrain is about as uncertain as I am. That said, aside from my headlamp, I'm about to charge into the dark all the same, because as challenging as what lies ahead may seem to me, it pales in comparison to the quest of my crew. Put another way, caving with equipment, not for the faint of heart. Well, this is the uh, Tumbling Rock Cave Preserve that's owned by the Southeastern Cave Conservancy and it's located in Jackson County, Alabama. Okay. So the Southeastern Cave Conservancy, just as a little piece, is the world's largest cave conservation organization that's dedicated solely to cave conservation. Um, the cave contains all kinds of neat things. So we've got some Civil War relics in here. We have some Civil War signatures. We've got lots of water. Um, I've been in some caverns, but this is my first time really exploring a cave. Do you have any tips for, um, I guess, beginners or folks out there who are watching sure. and they've never explored caves either? Yeah, absolutely. So you can see we're, we're wearing helmets. Right. We have head-mounted lights. Yeah. We've got the right clothes on. You know, we should be nice and warm. Mm -hmm. Always want to make sure you have three sources of light with you. A uh, helmet like we have. Mm -hmm. um, you want to wear sturdy boots. Good foot gear uh, and clothes that are adaptable for the environment. So. All right. Well, I feel like I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's go explore let's some caves. Let's do it. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so here's our first bat. Yeah, that's a little, another so small. little bat. Yep. Yeah, they're not very big. Okay. So this is just one of the many creatures that call caves home. It's a 10-foot drop. You want to make sure you're careful going across it. So we're just going to cross over this one foot after the other. Would you like a hand? Yeah. Yep. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Got it's it. a little slick. It is yeah. a little slippery. So have you explored this cave in its entirety? Have I? Yeah. Um, I've been to all, I've been to different reaches of it. I okay. would not say that I've explored the entire thing. It's really big. Okay. And it takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. multiple trips to come back and see different pieces and parts. Okay. Um, really, I like to go through the cave and actually see the cave, you know, okay. and uh, I kind of consider myself a tourist caver, I guess, is mm -hmm. the best way to put it. And then I'll walk around and I want to see the formations and the mm -hmm. walls and you know, the rocks and the dirt and the water, and you mm -hmm. never know what you might see. Do you find that each time you come in here, you're, it's like a brand new experience, you, you see different things maybe you missed before? Absolutely, I've mm -hmm. been in and out of this cave a few times, and you know, I'll always see something different okay. that, that I didn't see before, generally speaking. Yeah. These are the Civil War vats, and there's about eight or nine of them, and so these have been here since uh, 
probably 1862 or 63. This place was pretty pertinent, you know, to the Civil War effort and, you know, all of that that was going on here. Um, it's pretty neat. There, there are many projects that happen on in and around SCCI preserves. So whether they're scientific projects or, in this case, this was actually an Eagle Scout project. We have things going on uh, across all of our preserves that are related to scientific research and preservation and conservation. So mm -hmm. um, one of the other things the SCCI has done ahead of uh, a good number of, of other organizations is our permitting process. Um, and so through our permitting process, not only do we know who's in the cave, right, or mm -hmm. we're supposed to know who's in the cave, um, we're also tracking the visitation of the cave. So mm -hmm. um, that helps us to understand a lot more about uh, what human impact has on the different species in the caves, the caves themselves. Mm -hmm. All this water that we've seen here behind us mm -hmm. and around us is actually coming in from the surface at some point. And one of the things that you hear about are, you know, people going out to sinkholes and throwing stuff in sinkholes and just figuring it's going to go away, or pouring oil or gasoline out in their backyard. You could be doing it miles from here, and that oil and gas or uh, basically toxin has the potential of finding its way into the cave. Oh, wow. And so that's why water conservation is so important. Alabama has served up quite a bit, from some shopping at the Unclaimed Baggage Center to an expedition into the underground. And now it's time for a healthy helping of home-cooked food. Well, I don't know about the healthy part, but then again, balance, right? It was originally founded by Mr. W.H. Payne in 1869. Mm -hmm. From 1869 till 1991, it was a pharmacy. 1991, it closed down briefly and then reopened up as just exclusively a restaurant. Everything about this place is very, very old. We could have chosen, you know, multiple ways to decorate this place. We have a 150-year span to choose. Yeah. But we figured uh, the 1950s was the most accurate representation of what we wanted to uh, put in this place. Okay, it gives it a cool vibe yeah. in here. Uh, how long have you been here, though? I have been here since uh, 2013, so five years last May. So we've had it for five years. Me and my mom are the owners of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then the Paynes family actually still owns the building and we rent it from them. Okay. So it's still in the Paynes family to this day. Okay. I went to school in Knoxville and I got a psychology degree. Okay. Graduated 2011. Um, and then, you know, I worked around in that field a little bit. I did some work with children in psychological hospitals mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Never really felt like it was for me. Yeah. You know, I kind of felt like a fish out of water. So then I moved home and started working with my mom here, yeah. and I just, I love it, yeah. you know? Just being able to interact with people and, and see them and, and make them happy and have people tell me that this is the best thing they've ever eaten and stuff yeah. like that, and, and that they've driven from God knows where yeah. to get here. It makes me really happy. Do you get people from out of the United States? There's tons of people. I mean, I really want to get a map so I can keep track because mm -hmm. I've lost track of where they're. I've had several people from Mexico, um, France. I get a lot of French people because really? there's a factory that hires from France and they come really? into town for that. Okay. Um, one of our customers actually brought in her relatives from Ireland one day. Really? Yeah, it was a whole family of Irish people. I could barely oh. understand. <laughs> Even though they were speaking English, I'm like, okay. <laughs> this is like a place that people want to come check out. Mm -hmm. And it's worth the trip. Yes. And so I have to ask you, Strauss. what's going on with the ceiling? <laughs> I love the straw. So apparently it was a trend back in the 30s, 40s, 50s for people to shoot their straw wrappers onto the ceiling. We actually really? have a picture from Life magazine that uh, depicts the kids shooting straws and, oh, this, yes, and the soda jerk <laughs> yelling at the kids. So we just thought, you know, why don't we bring this back? Why don't we yeah. make that our thing? And it's a great conversation starter because nobody ever knows what they are, but they are yeah. straw wrappers. I didn't. I was staring at them earlier, and I'm like, what is hanging from their yeah. ceiling? And I could tell it was meant to be there. Yeah. But I'm like, what is Because there's that? so many. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them are from employees demonstrating how to do it, but a few okay. of them, probably about 25% are from actual customers actually oh, being really? able to get them up there. It's, wow. it's difficult, but it's doable. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if that's a thing. You have, like, kids still coming yeah. in and trying they to do. get them up there. That's they cool. do. Serving at an institution like Payne's Sandwich Shop means a lot more than red slaw and ice cream scoops. It means opening your family to others. It means delivering deals that are not only hard to beat, but allow folks to take a break and come together. For the crew and I, it meant a much-deserved meal after a hard-won walk through wild terrain. 
and smiles over simple pleasures that sunk in far beyond our bellies. I spent most of my summers on the water growing up, but like a lot of things on this series, I'm afraid I may have only skimmed the surface. So to get started, I'm setting out to understand a permitting process that puts parameters on what docks can do in order to ensure that reservoirs are for more than just recreation. We're sitting here on beautiful Gunnersville Reservoir. We've kind of picked this place because you can sort of look around in a, you know, kind of a 360 degree view and see a lot of different examples of how we manage land and the different types of uses. And so what we'll probably see the most of today is, is what we call Zone 7, which is shoreline development. It's open for uh, folks to actually construct and install their own private dock on that. And okay. they've, they've got that because we typically sold them some type of right to cross our property and to you know put some type of private use on there. Okay. Because we knew that people would be building houses and they're on the lake, they're gonna need a place to park their boat. So we are sitting approximately right in this area here. And we're gonna take a quick boat ride a little ways and do a compliance check in an embayment as it loads, uh, right in this area, right in this area here. So we're not too far from where we're, where we're headed. Okay, so typically what we do is we take the permit with us that we issued, mm -hmm. and we just kind of want to look to make sure that the conditions have been in here too, that the size is correct, okay. uh, and that you know the vegetation has been um, cared for. Mm -hmm. We typically put conditions in the permit that say that you know it will be disturbed at a minimum, yeah. and uh, so we'll just do some measuring yeah. and see what we come up with. That's so what this this handy guy. Is that's do, exactly right. right. Okay. You know we can do a lot of this on the computer, but it's always good to kind of get a a feel and sort of lay out a site plan yeah. of, of what's what. So you, you really sort of get a feel and you can talk intelligently to the applicant about what's there and what's going on. Okay. So just reset our measuring wheel and we'll just take off. All right. And we'll walk down there towards this other dock. You think that thing was on Shark Tank? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made a mint out of the measuring bike. With over 890 miles of shoreline, Gunnersville Lake allows lake life to lend itself to a long list of pastimes. From sport fishing and swimming to camping and cruising, the 76 mile run has room for all. But surprisingly, at least for me, sailing is even on that list. I may be a novice, but that doesn't mean I'm about to bow out. I think I'm gonna cut the motor and we're gonna start looking at putting sails up. Ready for the main sail? Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Sailing. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. So this is you a main sail. Mm -hmm. We just raised it. Okay. And Oops. now we're gonna yeah. raise our jib. Put that in. Ariel's gonna pull it up. Awesome. Okay. All right, so two hands. Okay. All right, and just pull. He'll tell you when to stop. He's gonna feed it in the groove. This takes a little muscle. It does. Everybody thinks it's sitting and drinking wine. <laughs> All right, we're sailing nice. now. And so we don't have much wind today. We got a little bit enough mm -hmm. to fill sails and stuff. Okay. Okay, so when you're sailing, mm -hmm. you wanna look forward to the bow of your boat. And so with a tiller, the boat's gonna go the opposite way you, you steer it, right? Yep. So yeah, like you, that would so be if you my push trouble, it away, so push it like, you're gonna go this yeah. way. And what'll happen is you'll get so close to the wind, your sail's gonna drop. It's gonna go beep. Oh, yep. starting to. Yep, yeah. so then you need to come back. Okay. 
now start to take it back. Yeah, okay, and then let's get our sail full. All right, there we go, right in there. So we're not zooming around today because mm. we don't have a lot of wind. Right. But there's a little bit of wind out yeah, there. I can keep see it. That way. We're gonna go get but that that's wind. what it does. You know, it tempts you to keep going. It's never right where you want to be. Yeah. So we've been sailing for quite a while. I've been sailing here for probably 13, 14 years, yeah. something like that. Okay. Have you started like a, a group here or a club? There is a club here, uh, Browns Creek Sailing Association, that we sail out of. And so I teach classes there. Okay. Teach privately. I teach classes for them. So I'm in good um, hands. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> good hands. I teach kids. I, I'll teach anybody. Because anybody can sail. It's okay. great. It's a great lifelong yeah. sport. Got to get okay. kids yeah. sailing early. Mm -hmm. You really do. And sailing with your parents is, you know, the best way yeah. to do it. When um, I think of sailing, I do not think of northern Alabama. Why here and what makes this so special? Because I feel like it's a hidden gem. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's a beautiful lake. You know, mm -hmm. back in the 30s, the, the they flooded the Tennessee River and they mm -hmm. built dams and locks on it. And Lake Gunnersville is just, has turned out to be a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And it's huge, really. Yes. We lived in Huntsville for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, in January, we bought a house down here on the lake so that nice. we could be closer. It, it is a really special place. So we'll we'll go to the grocery store, we'll go someplace, go across the causeway, and we go, we live here. Yeah. yeah. Isn't this beautiful? It yeah. is really pretty. Yeah. And we sailed yeah. last night in the full moon. We haven't sailed at night in a while. And it was just, it was just gorgeous. If a person knew absolutely nothing about sailing, but they wanted to get into it. How do they do that? Where's the best place to start? Hand her the tiller. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's what way to do it. Uh, you asked, you get to start. It. There you go. Um, a great way to do it is just show up at a sailing marina. Okay. You know, just show up on a Saturday, and sailors always want more crew on their boat. They really? always want to take they'll, people They'll out. use any excuse to go sail. Yeah. So it's a welcoming community. It is a know. very you don't have welcoming to be community. Nervous to approach no, somebody and you and... just say, hey, I've never sailed before, but I, I want to go out with you. Okay. And somebody will put you on their boat. Do you find that more women are getting into sailing? No, In this that's... area, Typically, mm -hmm. the man is on the helm, <laughs> and the wife is crew. And Doesn't so the women that, that go sail, the women that go sailing, uh, stick to crew jobs. I try to get people to change because obviously being on the helm doesn't require a lot of muscle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so save your muscle here for uh, <laughs> adjusting your sails and you know pulling up the anchor and doing all that stuff. T and Susan remind me that teamwork makes the dream work, and I don't just mean the dance they do on board. In a single trip, I can see that sailing is an art, as well as a science, and one that deserves to be passed on. We've covered quite a bit of ground, but we're about to go out with a bang. More specifically, we're going out with a gorge, not to mention one heck of a hike to uncover a few of its hidden treasures. And to help me down the hill, I brought along local Frank Emery, who is not only a nature photographer, but an author on often overlooked escapes in Alabama. So Frank, we've hiked in into Pisgah Gorge, and this is the second waterfall. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I would love to hear more about kind of like your journey, what got you into photography, and what connection you had to this area, maybe why you love to photograph it so much. I just like to explore different places in Alabama, and uh, it's been so long ago I forgot how I discovered this place, but mm -hmm. I came here to check it out, and it's one of my favorite places in Alabama. Yeah. When you come in here each time and you take pictures, are you always trying to find something new? Or? It's always exploration, uh, always looking for something new and uh, new compositions. Different times of the year, the place looks different. Like right now, it's a little water, somewhat of a trickle, but uh, I've been here when it was flooding and mm -hmm. the convergence between this little Bright Creek and Bright Creek. Every time I've been here, it's a little different. Okay. What would you say makes this area so special? I mean, to me, it's kind of obvious, the view, the waterfalls, but to people who've never been here, you know, what could you say from your perspective that makes it so special? The fact that not many people have come in here that I know of. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's such a rough terrain that few people have, that I know of have ventured down. At least there's not a lot of photos on the internet like yeah. other places. Yeah. So that kind of makes mm -hmm. it special. It's still relatively unknown. Mm -hmm. 
to the vast majority of Alabamians or the world. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about it, but I'm so glad I do now. When I was heavily involved in photographing the state, I spent so much time that the phrase, there's no place like home, exploring nature became so much like home that when I wasn't, I missed it. It's like mm -hmm. I need to get back home into nature mm -hmm. exploration. Mm -hmm. Would you say that your journey um, with photography has sort of given you a new love for Alabama? Definitely. Uh, I had no idea. You know, driving the interstates or roads, you just see mm -hmm. plain woods. Mm -hmm. and you don't know what's out there, but mm -hmm. it's a lot to discover. As is often the case with a hike, the slopes were steep, but the scenery was more than worth it. It's amazing what we miss in this life if we aren't willing to step out of our comfort zone and break a sweat, which brings us back to balance. Too often, I think we tell ourselves that being in balance means that we'll be comfortable, when actually it's the opposite. You see, it takes work to keep from toppling over, just like it takes attention to accept all that life has to offer. This trip took me all over the place, and I'm better for it. I might have broken a sweat, but I also sank my teeth in. So the next time you feel like sinking because the sailing is less than smooth, seek out what this moment has to say. What can it tell you and teach you? It may be those very lessons that set you up for success downstream.